The gap, in my opinion, from my first play of the Marauders expansion to where I am now is fairly significant. Hey, I'm Alex Ratcliffe from Board Game Co, and today I'm reviewing the Root, the Marauder expansion, and the Hireling box at the same time. These two things together, basically what the latest batch of Root has added, the latest Kickstarter, latest expansion have added to Root, less the new Autonomous. I don't, I don't really play with those uh, single AI factions, and so I'm covering all of these, not any of those. I will, at some point in the near future, be doing a full comprehensive review of Root, basically base game and all the expansions, my experiences with it so far. I've talked about Root many times in the channel, I've never than a full dedicated review, so I'll try to do that, incorporating my full feelings of Root from base to everything. But for today, we're just talking about the Marauder Expansion and the Hirelings Box, what they do, what they add to Root, and then my opinions of the various elements of them, uh, which parts improve the experience, which parts I still have doubts about, and then we'll go from there. So, timestamps as usual, down below. So let's start off. Root, the Marauders expansion, is going to start with adding you two new factions. We're going to have the Lord of the Hundreds and the Keepers and Iron. At a high-level overview, and this will be high-level overview if you want a full detailed uh, listing of what they do, there are other channels that will have that, but Lord of the Hundreds are going to be the rats over here. The Lords of the Hundreds are going to be ruling primarily. The, their, their approach to playing the game is basically just slash and burn. Destroy every single thing behind them as they parade around, drop their mob tokens, and destroy everything. What they're going to do is every single round, any mob tokens that are currently on the board at the beginning of the round, you're going to go ahead and destroy any enemy tokens in those regions. So just poof, everything goes up in smoke. Not the the enemy warriors, but any bu enemy buildings, enemy tokens, whether it's the Corvid Conspiracies little, you know, uh, plots that they're working on, whatever it might be. Anything that you can possibly have on the board that isn't an actual figure will be removed. And from there, you'll start spreading the mob. Then you and the Lord of the Hundreds, your warlord, is going to start wandering around the board trying to destroy every single person. You're going to be collecting various goods, all those trinkets that other players have crafted, whether from the relic spaces or the rune spaces themselves, or from other players, or even from yourself crafting. You will gather those tokens and you'll put them into your horde, and your horde makes you more powerful, but it also restricts you at the same time. You see, you have these mood cards, and you're going to be choosing a mood that will give you some sort of competitive advantage. The balance is every mood shows a different type of, re of icon, a crafted good, and if you have that crafted good, you cannot choose that mood. You're going to have to choose something else instead. So as you get more powerful, you will also restrict yourself more and more. But the upside is well worth the downside. Because as you do that, you increase your command and your prowess, and that will enable you to do more things. It'll enable you to recruit more people, to take more actions, to charge across the board more confidently with your warlord. And so you're trying to get these goods, you're trying to attack others, you can loot other players, which is where you don't deal hits in battle, instead you steal crafted goods from them while they're still able to attack back. So a temporary potential downside, but for something that will be a more permanent upside as you grow your command and prowess and become increasingly more powerful. At the end of the turn, you're going to get points for the number of clearings that you rule that other players do not have any tokens in whatsoever. You are trying to destroy everything. You want the world to burn, you want to watch it burn, and you want to be in control of the empty ashes as you parade around the board. That's the Lord of the Hundreds. From there we have the Keepers and Iron. The Keepers and Iron are going to be a very, very different approach. They like shiny things. That's what they do. They like shiny things. They're going to be hunting for relics of past battles. To start off the game, you're going to be setting up various relics into all the clearings on the board, and you are trying to extract those clearings and recover them. To that end, you're going to have a bit of a control system, similar to the Irie. Uh, you're going to have your, something called your retinue, which is where you're going to start the board, start the game with three cards to slot into your, into your areas, and those will allow you to do different things. They'll allow you to move, to battle, to delve, then to move and recover. But along the way, you can add more cards to your retinue, allowing you to do more things. Moving is pretty simple. You move from one region to another. When you battle and then delve, that's a little bit more tricky, because battling is simple. You battle, but when you're done with the battle, if you still rule the clearing with a warrior, with one of your keepers, keepers, keeper warriors, then at that point, you have the opportunity to delve into the clearing. You can delve into the clearing where there will potentially be a relic on the board, and you're going to flip it over and see how many regions you control around that relic. Because the higher the number of the relic, the more points you will potentially score, but the more regions around the relic, the more clearings you need to rule. And so you're trying to be mindful of setting yourself up, almost as if these like excavation expeditions around certain clearings, as you start taking things out from the clearings, and then when you're done with that, in the recover action, you'll go ahead and recover them for points, slotting them into your track over here, getting the points shown between 1, 2, or 3, and getting an additional 2 points for every column. You can start charging up that track very aggressively if you're able to set up your little expeditions, but you have to be mindful because your people, your units, do not like ever being more than 3 at a time. And so you're trying to just create this structure where you're going to be drawing a lot of cards from your way stations. If you get your way stations down the board, that can help you a lot. 
you'll draw a lot of cards, you'll move your people around, you'll spend cards to recruit more, more warriors, and you're going to try to extract and recover as many relics as possible. They're playing their own little mini game, but as they're doing so, players will start to intervene. As you start charging up that point track, people will realize that your expeditions are going to cause you to win, and they will aggressively try to get in the way, at which point you have to see just how powerful you are. One of, my, one of the favorite abilities that they have, though, is something that whenever they have a relic with a bunch of warriors, you ignore the first hit in battle, which is hugely impactful. That makes you much more likely to win, making you more of a threat, making it more costly for any player to engage with you. The trade-off is in order to do that, you have to not actually be recovering that relic. So there's a constant trade-off of trying to get as many points as possible versus trying to hold onto those relics to give you the protection you need to gather more relics, to survive another round. They have a lot of weaknesses, but they can be incredible, incredibly meaningful and impactful to the game as you go through it. I will talk about the other things shortly, but I want to talk about these two factions first. So, let's talk about my opinion of the Lord of the Hundreds and the Keepers and Iron and where they stack up in the factions of Root. My first game, I was playing as Lord of the Hundreds. My very first playthrough of the Marauders expansion, I played as the Lord of the Hundreds, and someone else played as the Keepers and Iron. The Lord of the Hundreds had the potential after that first game to be one of my favorite factions in Root, although, to be fair, it's because I was literally charging forward with the victory and destroying everyone as I swept across the board, creating more units and just charging and taking over. That was our first experience as a group with the Lord of the Hundreds, and we very quickly learned that you had to keep the Lords and Hundreds in check, not that differently than the Woodland Alliance. You have to keep them weak, because if they get strong, they become too strong. So you have to hold them down, you have to make them feel like they don't have a chance of winning for the first half of the game, and that will give you a chance of winning as they eventually break through and power up. That will happen. And so our first game didn't have that, which meant I had a lot of fun playing them. Possibly not as much fun as if I was on the opposing team, but I had a lot of fun playing Lord of the Hundreds, and they very quickly shot up to become one of my favorite factions after game one. Keepers and Iron, on the other hand, Keeper and the, Keepers and Iron had a very different experience. I was not playing as them, but watching them be experienced, they, they had a much harder time getting the engine up and running. They felt like they were, they were completely disconnected from the rest of the root experience. They were doing their own thing, they weren't being as efficient as they needed to, so they were very behind the track, and they just kind of felt like they were off in their corner, digging for relics, and other players didn't need to interact with them. Now, as we started playing these expansions more, my opinions shifted dramatically. The Keepers and Iron, which had the potential to be my least favorite faction in Root, possibly less than the Wizards, I'm, the Lizards, I'm not sure, and the Lord of the Hundreds ha being, having the potential to be my favorite faction, right behind the Iry, who is always my favorite faction, I love setting myself up for failure and failing time and time again, the gap on those closed. Lord of the Hundreds went down a few notches. I still like them a lot, don't get me wrong. I really enjoy what they add to Root. They add a more aggressive version of the Woodland Alliance. The Woodland Alliance, as you crush them, as you hold them down, they eventually start getting more and more powerful and break through, and you can no longer hold them to be just weak and on their own. Lord of the Hundreds has a similar engine with the feeling of a drop more agency. If you can break through, which you have that control, a drop more control as you craft, as you choose what two items to add, as you try to loot other players, as you potentially let yourself get hurt just so you can stabilize and take over others... I like what the Lord of the Hundreds do a lot. They're not as powerful as I first experienced them, which is good because that was broken, but as you know how to deal with them, as you know how to hold them in check, I really like the twist they bring, giving me the feeling of three different factions. They have the feeling of the Irie in the sense that if your Warlord ever dies, you're going to kind of face an entire turn without being able to spawn half your units, and that can hurt your engine a lot. So you want to keep your Warlord al alive, you do not want to fail with them, so they have a little bit of the feeling of the Irie in that sense. They also have the feeling of the cats and the way they can spread across the board and they have just so many units or perhaps even the, the moles a bit more. And then they have the feeling, most likely, of most similarly to the Woodland Alliance, at least for myself, in the way that they have to be kept in check because they start off weak and can aggressively become powerful if you forget what your job is when you're dealing with the Lord of the Hundreds. Then from there we have the Keepers and Iron. Keepers and Iron start off very not positive in what they were doing. But the problem is, the Keepers and Iron, if you don't, as you start to learn how to play the Keepers and Iron, they actually have a very solid point engine running if you don't interfer. Our initial complaints and critiques around the Keepers and Iron came down to the fact that you can kind of just ignore them. They weren't strong enough in what they were doing, and they weren't interacting with other players. They were playing their own game, off in their own corner, digging for relics, and no one else cared. But if you get good at that game, if you figure out how to position yourself, if you figure out how to put down your way stations, if you're drawing three cards a turn and you're spawning your badges all over the board and you're starting to move across the board, gather your relics, and improve your retinue because you can get a chunk of cards. If you do your own thing properly early game, you can draw tons of cards into your hand and start cycling into a retinue of 10 different cards. And that means you can start sacrificing cards because as you choose different actions in your retinue, some cards will fail depending on what happens. But if you build up your retinue quickly, you can afford that failure. Failure. You can become a force to be reckoned with, and so as soon as we realized how strong they could be, 
they start shooting off the point track. And as they start shooting off the point track, what quickly happens is other players have to get involved. So yes, while it's true that the Keepers and Iron are playing their own game, they are playing a powerful game. Similar to the Lord of the Hundreds to a, similar to the Keepers and Iron, similar to the Lord of the Hundreds to a degree, if you let them do their own thing, they will become unstoppable. So at a certain point, not as early or aggressively as with the Lord of the Hundreds, but at a certain point, you have to step in, you have to take control, and you have to try hurting their artifact engine. You have to start hurt, stopping them from gathering all those shiny things. And so the Lord, the Keepers and Iron quickly have grown in our opinion of them, as we've encountered, as we've dealt with the fact that they are indeed a force to be reckoned with, as we've dealt with the fact that they do generate a lot of points, their entire positioning changed. Because they, they are happy to sit in a corner on their own. They are happy to be undisturbed. But you will have to disturb them in order to have a chance at all, at which point the, the challenge of keeping those relics, of holding on to them, versus giving them up for points, that on its own is one of the huge parts of the Keepers and Iron that I particularly enjoy and appreciate. Having a three-point relic that somebody else can take away from you and get two points in the process, versus holding on to it because it's keeping your units alive, is a lot of fun. Then add to, add to that the process of taking your way stations up and down. You're going to be giving up cards whenever you do so, but you can potentially get a bunch of way stations moving across the board, popping new badges up, taking them back down, putting your stuff where you need them the most in order to extract the relics from the board and in order to get them recovered so you can get as many points as possible. The Keepers and Iron, while they are not my favorite faction, they have grown significantly since I've been playing with them, and I really enjoy what they add to the root experience. In fact, to a certain degree, the Lord of the Hundreds feels less unique in terms of what it's adding. The Keepers and Iron feels more unique, although I still prefer the Lord of, Lord of the Hundreds more. And that's this part of the experience. From there we talk about the Hirelings. The Hirelings come with a few Hirelings in the basic box, as well as a bunch of Hirelings you can add through the Hirelings box. The Hirelings are a bunch of characters that are meant to augment your game of Root to make a lower player count more friendly, or you can add at a higher player count if you just want to add more chaos and more stuff to the experience, but the main point and intent is to make a two or three player game of Root more fleshed out, more rounded out as you add more things to the board. You're going to choose various factions of various units, and you're going to take those various characters, and they're, they're often associated with different factions, but you're going to take them, you're going to put them on the board, and they'll have some some sort of impact in the way they interact in the world of Root. That way, the, the way they interact is as you hit four, eight, and twelve points. Whenever you play with hirelings, you're gonna have tw you're gonna have three hirelings in place. As you hit four, eight, and twelve points, players are going to take those hirelings and start taking control of them. The player who's in the lead will generally get control of them first, but they will have control of them for a lower amount of time, and then they'll have to give them to other players who will get to roll that die and get to control of them for a higher amount. The player in the lead only counts the gold. All other players count all. That's the number of turns you have control of the hirelings. When you have the hirelings, you get to do something extra. They're not as powerful as your own units. If I use hireling forces to attack your, your tokens and remove them from the board, I don't get points. They will count for rule in my regions, and they will enable me to shift the dynamic of control across the board. Moving a horde of cats into a region so that I can rule it, or so that you are more repressed and you can't even escape because now there's nowhere for you to go, that can change the game state even if I'm not gathering points for the tokens I'm destroying. And this little uh, wooden, pr wooden protector, as he wanders along, killing one unit of every other player in the regions he moves to and preventing you from placing down tokens, Tokens, they add a degree of control to the game. Now, all these tokens over here, and there's piles of them. If you have the Hirelings box, there's absolute piles of them. All corresponding, to, well, most of them corresponding to different factions. All these tokens will have uh, both uh, two different sides to them. They'll have the demoted and the promoted side. The promoted side is going to give you the various tokens for the Hirelings, as well as abilities of how they interact. And the demoted side just gives you an ability. It makes your faction slightly stronger through use of an ability, but through no presence of board control. And all of these have some different way that they do things. It might just be more units on the board. It might be an ability. It might be some sort of prevention or control. If you're playing, uh, let's see, the Flame Bearers. The Flame Bearers over here. Doing setup, you'll place two Flame Bearer Warriors amongst any clearings, even the same one. If no Bearer Warriors on the map, place two Bearer Warriors amongst any clearings. So you're constantly going to be placing them out, ensuring that they are holding those flames. In each clearing with any Bearer Warriors, this is going to be at the start of Birdsong. In each clearing, clearing with any Bearer Warriors, you must remove one enemy piece per Barrier Warrior there, Warriors first. So they're going to be removing tokens just wandering around, and you must place one Bearer Warrior at a Bearer Warrior or adjacent to one if you cannot place two Bearer Warriors in any clearing. So these Bearer Warriors are going to get stronger and stronger, taking down various pieces, just slowly destroying enemy units. Each of these factions, each of these hireling factions is going to give a different way that they interact with the game state, a different thing for players to be mindful of, and they are often being passed to the person who has the least points. So they operate in two capacities. The first is that they flesh out your game of root, which is very helpful if you're playing it at two or three players. The second is that they act as a catch up mechanic to a degree. Players, once they relinquish control of the hirelings, will pass them around to other players, and inherently, they 
will likely pass into the players who have the fewest points as opposed to the players who have the most points, resulting in even more control for taking down the leader, for ensuring that the leader does not run away. They add a degree of balance to a two-player game. That aspect of escaping but not having people pull you back, that will now happen because now I can control a few factions to help pull you back. And in a three-player game, that can get even more escalated. In a three-player game, someone who's in the lead can have the two game, the two other factions in the game, as well as two hireling factions, potentially tearing them down, pulling them back, which is why I both love and have complaints about the hirelings. I love the variability that the hirelings give to the game. I love, I love every single one of these cards. At least I haven't played with all of them yet, but I love every single one that I've played with so far. They all add something new. They take elements of who the characters are, who the factions are in your other games of Root, and they extract some small, minute element of them to the gameplay. And they give you something else to be mindful of at lower player counts. They flush out the board, which is amazing. I will happily play Root at two or three players now easily. I've never played with the autonomous factions. I don't love that quite as much. I'd rather play a different game. The hirelings don't feel like autonomous. Us. They feel like something else that really adds to your experience, and it flushes out the boards while giving you powers and abilities, which is excellent. The part that I hate, the part that I really don't like, and I haven't decided whether to house rule around it just yet, is specifically at three players, I find that the pull down the leader can get too dramatic. I'm not confident yet, I need more plays, I've had plays where it went well, I've had plays where it did not go so well, but inherently root to its very core is a game of pull down the leader. The problem is when you have pull down the leader, there's a balance of how much you want in a game. Pull down the leader a little bit gives the player the opportunity through clever play to outmaneuver their opponents, to persevere, and to gain the win. If you throw too much pull down the leader into a game, you end up with a situation, you end up with a game state in which the game is to pull down whoever you can as much as possible until eventually one player breaks through and that can result in unsatisfying plays where you don't feel you earned your win, you feel you simply had too many people pulling down someone else, and then I, I scraped through. Lucky me. I find the hirelings work excellently in a two-player game. In a three-player game, the aspect of passing them down to the player on the bottom, I find that it can result in having effectively four factions, or two factions plus two helpers, tearing down the person who's winning. Again, not all our plays, but certainly some of them, and I don't love that much pull down the leader. As of right now, we're currently debating whether to house will, you know, you just pass them clockwise, or maybe whoever you pass them to, uh, I, I haven't figured out the exact option, maybe when you pass, I don't know. There's gotta be some point maneuver or some a aspect of the game in which I can utilize the hirelings at a three player account without it resulting in the risk that the person who's winning will not have a fun game because they will feel like they were pulled down, not because the other players were better than them, but because you simply gave them too much power. And so while I love what the hirelings do, and I love how they interact with the two-player game, I currently have mixed thoughts on how they interact with the three-player game. Time will tell. I'm not ready to house rule just yet. I need more plays. I need more context, more experience with it. But right now, I certainly have that doubt around them. And then lastly, Lastly, we'll have a bunch more locations. These are more take it or leave it for me. I like what they add, but I don't necessarily love them. I'm telling you my opinion before we talk with them. These are going to be various locations, little landmarks. We're going to have the tower, the lost city, the tower we're already familiar with, the elder treetop, the ferry, the legendary forge, the black market. Uh, the legendary forge and black market, let's say the black market, for instance, will give you three cards that you're going to go ahead. You're going to play with faction pieces and may swap one face down card. You're going to be placing three cards by the black market before the game begins, and players can interact and swap cards with the black market, putting a card from their hand to take one of the cards from the black market. Each of these tokens, this one will act as, this token here will act as each of the three types of uh, fox, rabbit, and mouse for the clearing that it's in, giving you more control or potentially more bad things depending on who you are. So all these cards give you another element that can interact with the game state. You can choose to have as many or as few as you like, and it gives you a little bit more chaos to the board, a little more something else to be happening in the game state. I like these. I never loved the landmarks. I can I appreciate that they can add to the experience of Root. They can add to the variability. Root is such a variable experience as it is, though, especially if you have all the effect, all the expansions, which I currently do, that I don't necessarily need them. Don't get me wrong. I play with them and I enjoy them, but they're they're kind of like, hey, they're nice to have. I enjoy them, which is a good time to move into final thoughts on Root, the Hirelings, and the Marauders, the Hirelings. Do you need this? Should you get this expansion? All of that. So. The new factions. New factions, the very short opinion of all that is I really like the new factions. They both add something new to my experience, having elements of reminiscence to prior factions while being very different in their own right. If you like more faction variety in Root, if you find yourself wanting to have a little bit more variety to the factions you can play as, I think they're both solid, both worth, work pick, worth picking up, and I think the Lizards are still my least favorite faction uh, as of right now. As far as Hirelings, I think the Hirelings are huge. Uh, as far as whether you need them or not, it's a little different though, because if you like playing Root at two players, I think the Hirelings are amazing. 
I highly, highly recommend them. If you like playing Root at four players, I think the hirelings are potentially fun to try to incorporate, but aren't as necessary and may make the game state a little more chaotic. I think for variety's sake, they're fun, but if you're enjoying the variety of Root in other elements, such as trying just different factions to begin with, I don't know if you need them at four players. Nice to have? Certainly. Necessary? Not as much. Three players, I, I'm pretty favorable on. Despite my, my caveats about it, I think that three players, it still makes three player Root a better experience when you have the hirelings involved, I have to figure out for ourselves as we continue to play it what house rules are necessary or not for our game group, but again, I need more plays. I, I am always willing to house rule things, but I like a lot more plays under my belt before I take that step. For right now, I have enjoyed every single game I've played with the Hirelings, and I would say I've enjoyed every every three-player game I've played with the Hirelings, I've enjoyed more than three-player games without the Hirelings, even when I felt that someone was being pulled down, whether me or someone else. And so I think it still is a favorable addition, with caveats that I need time to adjust around, but still very favorable. So two or three players, I highly recommend getting the Hirelings. And then of course, these over here, I like them, but they're not necessary, but I'm pretty sure they're not being sold on their own anyway, so that's kind of a material. So, do you need, this, do you need these expansions or not? Well, I mean, that's really your call, but I think that they are solid additions to what Root is bringing to your table. Uh, all of them I can easily recommend, and they will maintain Root. They, I would say, they they highly improve my opinion and rating of Root at a two or three a player at a two or three player count, while otherwise just maintaining more of the same. As far as what that more of the same is, like I said already, I'll have a full review and everything about Root coming probably next week as I fully dive into my full Root experience, what I like, don't like, all those elements that I've found with these games over the past several years. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you found this video helpful, and as always, have a good one.